The book is called Joe Biden, The Life, The Run, and What Matters Now. Evan Osnos, staff writer of The New Yorker, and uh, someone I've known for a very long time. So nice to have you back on G Zero World. My pleasure. Thanks for having me in. Timely topic. Uh, you got that started. Uh, it was not in any way uh, presumed that Biden was even getting the nomination, never mind becoming the president. You know, it was the kind of thing that came together as it became clear that he was a stronger candidate than we might have assumed at the very beginning. But I've had this kind of slightly weird fascination with him for a long time. I mean, going back to 2014, I started interviewing him because he was involved in foreign affairs. And the honest answer is, Ian, that part of the reason I was going to interview Joe Biden was that that actually wasn't a very um, sophisticated thing to be doing in Washington. Joe Biden was not the center of the action. Not a lot of people really paid that much attention to him, partly because he was in the vice presidency, which is kind of a maligned office, and partly because people just took him as part of the political furniture here. He'd been at it for so long, it was easy to look right past him. How energized was he running? all this way through? Because we know how deep the emotional tragedy has been. We know how much that threw him off his game. How did he gear up for this third presidential run at the age of 77? Well, he had more or less accepted the idea that his political career was probably over in 2015 when he gave that speech in the Rose Garden. Unfortunately, I believe we're out of time, the time necessary to mount a winning campaign for the nomination. But while I will not be a candidate, I will not be silent. And yet then there was this moment when, of course, and he's talked about this publicly, he, you know, the, the sight of those marchers in Charlottesville for him really was a sort of call to arms where he felt like there was this moral emergency confronting the United States. I mean, nothing short of something as serious as that. And I think that was galvanizing to him. I mean, the idea that there was not just this r radical danger facing the United States in the presidency of Donald Trump and in what he was generating in the population at large, but then also the, the, the political side of Joe Biden looked at the field of contenders and he thought, I don't think they're gonna beat him. So for that reason, it was energizing. But I think we also have to be realistic here. Joe Biden was helped very much by the fact that this campaign went virtual in the spring of 2020 because it kept him off the road. He was sleeping in his bed every night. He was working out. He was giving the speeches to his fundraisers. They were disciplined. He wasn't going off prompter, to use the expression of, of what his aides sometimes say. So the circumstances conspired to help him at a moment when it would, it would help fill in whatever flagging energy he might have had. Obama in the last few weeks of the campaign was absolutely critical for Joe Biden. Obama was virtually nowhere in the early stages of the campaign. How challenging was that for Biden? I think there is a, a, a pretty multi-layered relationship there. It's not a simple one. I mean, the, 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 the nice version of it, and it's a real version, is these are two guys who never thought they were going to be particularly close. They ended up as a kind of shotgun marriage on the ticket in 2008. And they, to their mutual astonishment, ended up being quite friendly with each other in a, in a deep way. I mean, when Bo Biden got sick... Barack Obama told Joe, do not take out, you know, a loan to pay for these medical treatments if you need help or to keep the family actually really afloat. I'm going to give you the money. And Biden didn't end up needing it. But there was a real relationship there. And then there was the problem, which is Barack Obama believed that Hillary Clinton was in many ways the natural heir to the Obama administration. And he made that his choice in 2016. Uh, obviously, Biden didn't run. And then you get to 2020. And I think there was to some degree, a feeling that Obama understood that the best chance to secure his legacy and to secure the future of the Democratic Party uh, was to make sure that Joe Biden won this race. Once it became clear it was Joe Biden, he gave it him his full support. What has surprised you most about the man, about what drives him? You know what surprised me, Ian, was that when we hear about Joe Biden, the, the image that we usually get is the, as a British diplomat put it to me, uh, the spigot that you can turn on but you can't turn off, the guy who will speak to fill whatever space is available. And what you actually find is that at this stage in his life, 
here he is in his eighth decade when a lot of people are, frankly, in more of a broadcasting mode than a listening mode. He's actually become a more attentive listener, a person that is actually more inclined to want to pick up information that he doesn't already have than he was 20 years ago. Most of what President Trump uh, tried to use to beat on Biden, you know, sort of bounced off, right? Because, I mean, you know, there, there weren't the obvious negatives uh, that there were with Hillary Clinton, for example. But the one that did stick was Sleepy Joe. The one that did stick was the incoherence. So, you know, you've spent a lot of time with him. Talk about that. What I find interesting, and I was hearing some of the same kind of reflections from people, also particularly around the world. You know, people, I think uh, in other foreign capitals, you were, I was often getting that question from people, which is how, how sharp is he? There's a couple of important details I think that are worth pointing out. For one thing, he came into this race out of shape. I mean, out of, he wasn't tuned up as a political figure. He'd spent what can be sort of the most destructive period for a candidate, which is to say he'd spent it in semi-retirement as the boss of bosses, nobody ever cutting him off, nobody ever debating him, nobody ever criticizing him. All of a sudden, he's back into the trenches. And he lacked discipline in, in the best of times around that kind of thing, right? And yeah. that's the second piece. That's the key piece of this, is that I think uh, for people who are tuning into Joe Biden now, what they see is a man who, to borrow James Comey's expression, will start a conversation in direction A and end it at direction Z. But what we also know is that if you've been looking at Biden over the long term, 10, 20, 25 years, he has been accused of versions of that forever. That's partly how his mind works. It's partly because he doesn't use a prompter. He doesn't, doesn't feel comfortable. It goes back to having the stutter. He moves more slowly across the stage. His voice is clearly raspier. But if you listen to his interviews, real interviews, I mean, in-depth interviews, what you find is that his mind is unchanged from where it was a few years ago. Is your sense this is a guy who's thinking this is a one-term thing. I don't get that sense, actually. And I think part of that is, you know, his political nerve endings tell him that the moment that he signals that uh, this is a one-term thing, that cuts his legs out from under him. All we'll, we'll, be, we'll be talking about is who's next. He's sort of, in some sense, you know, it's political malpractice 101 for him to do that. But I also think there's another piece of this. I've talked to him about the decision about when do you retire, when do you hang it up? And his belief is partly rooted in the idea that he looks back on his own father and he sort of had lobbied his dad to retire and he thinks that was a mistake. So he kind of pushed him out of it before he, he should have. And what he says is, look, take a look at me. And if I look like I'm losing a step, then it'll be time to be done. Now, uh, let's go to foreign policy for a little bit, which, you know, you and I spend a lot of time on. You know, your previous life uh, was in Beijing. You know, I remember when Biden was first announcing his run, and one of the things he said was that China wasn't really a threat, that Russia's a threat and China's, I mean, come on, they don't, they don't have any capabilities with the United States. Where is Joe on China right now? And, and has there been a lot of inconsistency there? I think the language that we heard in the beginning, and you, you framed it correctly, where he said, we don't have to worry about China, it's not a competitive threat. You know, I think that was a kind of misguided form of American chest thumping. It was essentially like, you know, hey, we've still got all of the innovative vigor and they don't have it because they don't have the culture. That is a, 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 that's a, a bit of an old standard that he was pulling off the shelf, but that's not an up-to-date view and it's not actually how he and his China team talk about it. But even now. as vice president, like in 2016, I, I was kind of stunned that he could have a view like that in 2019. Yeah, I think that there are, you know, he's not the first person in Washington to get locked into a conception of a complex issue like China and then more or less, you know, dine out on it ever since. I don't think that's the view that he holds now. I think what you hear from him, and I've talked to, I've talked to him about China, is that he looks at it and he basically believes that China has made mistakes in its own foreign policy in its relationship with, it, with its neighbors. The United States is not the only relationship that China has problems with right now. If you look around the G7, you look around the neighborhood, it has some serious problems. And I think that's a, that's a hint about how he sees the United States uh, leveraging that moment um, to refortify our own relationships and to isolate China. When I look more broadly at the fact that the United States has damaged its credibility internationally, do you think that's something he feels like he needs to address 
in a proactive way? And if so, how might he do it? I think that what you find is a, um, a humbled sense, not only of what the U.S. democracy looks like to the rest of the world, but also what the United States has to say and what it has to offer. You know, he comes in, I, I often, Ian, find myself identifying this kind of fusion between Biden's personal story and his political ideas. He is a humbled man at this point in his life, humbled by the fates, to be perfectly blunt about it, the death of his son, Bo, the ups and downs, losing presidential races along the way. And he comes to it at a moment when the United States should frankly be humbled too. I mean, here we are flat on our backs with the COVID epidemic, incapable of bringing even basic public health resources to bear. And he has to go out into the world and say, yes, we have made terrible mistakes in our recent past, but there is things that we can do and things we wanna do and we plan to return to the world community. If he was gonna surprise us in domestic orientation as a president, it would be where? I think if he's gonna surprise you, it may be on his recognition of the scale of the crisis around income inequality. Because in so many ways, the, the various things that beset this country come back to that basic failure to provide opportunity to people. And that doesn't mean he's gonna you know, come in tomorrow and introduce a wealth tax. But he cannot have a successful presidency without acknowledging the full scale of the ways in which the economic system is simply not working for people across the board. And it's not him saying it. It's, you know, as you and I both know, it's now CEOs who are looking down the, down the uh, runway and seeing where the future of the American economy is. So he's going to have to contend with that. I will tell you, Ian, one of the most interesting conversations I ever had with him was before Bernie Sanders was on the scene before Donald Trump was on the scene. In 2014, I was talking to Biden about politics and he said, look, I think the economic picture in this country is really rough for working people and the Democratic Party is failing them. We're not doing enough. And at the time, I honestly, Ian, didn't understand enough about what he was talking about to realize that he was onto something. And I didn't quote it at the time, I didn't get it. Of course, what he anticipated was what Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders later picked up on. So that is core to who Biden is, and I would expect him to be fairly active when it comes to trying to reform this economy to make it more productive for, for a wider swath of Americans. How do you think he's gonna deal with ex-President Trump? How's he gonna deal with the extraordinary calls to, to lit, you know, to, to op for cases to be open? Um, you know, for, for trials to proceed, for us to litigate, you know, so many calls of illegality all the way through, or, and, and, and at the same time, you have, um, you know, Biden reaching out uh, and saying, I, I want Trump supporters to, to be part of the same country and we all have to come together. I think that to begin with, when it comes to Trump himself, Biden's approach is becoming visible to us now. If you look at the way he has contended with Trump in this strange interregnum of kind of refusing the reality of the results of the election, his approach has been what I would describe as kind of pitying disregard, in effect saying it's embarrassing, uh, it's bizarre, uh, my word, not his, but not allowing himself to get drawn into the invention of a dispute. Trump thrives on the creation of conflict. And for there to be a conflict, you have to participate in it. And the truth is the law is on Biden's side and that gives him the insulation of being able to say of Donald Trump, uh, good luck to you. Now, I think the reality is that in the world that Biden will be dealing with, there's gonna be a pretty heavy demand for some kind of reckoning, some kind of accountability with this process. But Biden has also made clear, and I, 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 this is a deeply felt view, that if Biden allows himself to become personally involved in talking about prosecutions of former presidents or even members of the administration, that you're falling into precisely the kind of degrading indignity that was such a hallmark of the Trump years in which you had a president talking about locking people up. Does that also mean personally staying away from considering a pardon? I would be surprised if he pardons Donald Trump. I don't think that's in the cards. What about Mr. McConnell, what about um, a country that is so incredibly divided that is likely to still have a Republican Senate, though we won't know that until early January? Joe Biden certainly knows Senate and knows McConnell. 
better than almost any other living politician. But, you know, while Biden was vice president, these same cast of characters did everything possible to stop them from governing. Should our baseline expectation be it's the same thing? I think that should be our baseline expectation. Look, the, the GOP has indicated no interest in meeting Biden in some arena of cooperation. I mean, at the moment, they're participating in the fiction, by and large, uh, that there is still a pathway for Donald Trump. But I think if you get past the theater for a second, you see that there is something deeply different in the relationship that Biden has with McConnell uh, that Obama never had with McConnell. Some folks still don't, don't think I spend enough time with Congress. Why don't you get a drink with Mitch McConnell, they ask. Really? <laughs> Why don't you get a drink with Mitch McConnell? You know, I, I don't want to disregard completely the fact, for instance, Mitch McConnell was the only Republican senator who showed up at the funeral for Bo Biden in twenty sixteen. I remember that, absolutely. Mitch McConnell once called Joe Biden's office in the West Wing, got Biden on the phone and said, is there anybody over there who knows how to make a deal? And these two guys then got into a negotiation. They ended up coming up with the deal to avert the fiscal cliff, a deal that was unpopular, I should point out, with a lot of Democrats. But the point was that they did find some basis for at least a negotiation and ultimately a deal. Those kinds of connections, that, that background to the relationship is at the core of Biden's governing philosophy. Evan Osnos, the book is Joe Biden, The Life, The Run, and What Matters Now. Thanks a lot for being here. My pleasure, Ian, great to be with you.